Cars, the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. The Hamlet County Sheriff's Office calling all cars, attention all cars broadcast 292 regarding a missing person. Be on the lookout for Carl Hardy, missing from his home for two days. May be murdered. That's all. Rose and Clay. all owners of cars who are eager to find higher performance at lower cost. Your search is ended for the radically new and different all-purpose Rio Grande that packs twice as many vital ingredients as are found in most ordinary gasoline is no farther away than the red and white Rio Grande station in your neighborhood. Many motor fuels are made with one main purpose in mind. Some emphasize the element of casing head gasoline for easy starting. Some stress straight run gasoline for highway performance. Others place the accent on cracked gasoline alone for the start and stop driving in city traffic and mileage. Others call attention to stabilized gasoline for speedy acceleration. Some point to a poly gasoline content for anti knock performance. And others boast of tetraethyl lead for maximum power. All of these ingredients twice as many as the three found in ordinary fuel, are scientifically merged in Rio Grande's brand new cracked gasoline. That's what makes it the revolutionary, all-purpose motor fuel that powers the cars of the men who drive the most under all kinds of conditions. The men at the wheels of your police cars, ambulances, and other emergency equipment. Try a tank full tomorrow. And you'll agree with these difficult-to-please drivers of public-serving automobiles and tens of thousands of discriminating motorists that the new all-purpose Rio Grande crack deserve every word of its well-earned title, the most highly recommended gasoline of power and performance sold in the West. The story we are to hear tonight was taken from the facts supplied from the confidential files of the office of Sheriff James M. Froome of Tahoma County. We have therefore asked Sheriff Bloom to prepare a foreword for our program. It's a pleasure to join the scores of officers who appeared on Calling All Cars and to add my voice to the steadily increasing chorus of those who make it their business to prove that they criminally inclined that crime is a losing proposition. It might be a good thing, and it uh, certainly would be an interesting pursuit, to go back of the criminal acts of the lawbreaker to find out what makes him a criminal. But the work of the average law enforcement officer is so great that he has little time to do other than bring the criminal into court where his guilt can be determined and his punishment measured. In this work, he expects, and I'm proud to say, he usually gets the complete cooperation of other law enforcement officers. Tonight's story will serve as a model for that sort of cooperation that brings home to the criminal the truth of the statement that crime of any sort cannot pay. It was a bitterly cold winter evening during the opening weeks of 1938 in the city of Red Bluff, California. In a small lunchroom, a tall, slender, and well-dressed young man was eating his meal leisurely, and suddenly a pretty brown-haired girl slipped into the seat beside him. Um, would you mind terribly if I sat here a few minutes and talked to you? Hmm? All right. Oh, uh, no, of course I wouldn't mind. You go right ahead. Uh, I suppose this seems kind of funny to you. I mean... Me just barging in and starting to talk this way. Oh, I wouldn't say that. I'm glad you did. Honestly, I don't make a practice of talking to strange men, but you look like a right guy, and, well, you look kind of lonesome, too. <laughs> I'm afraid you hit it right, girly. That is the part about being lonesome, anyway. But don't tell me a pretty kid like you hasn't got lots of boyfriends around here. Oh, none that I like very well. I work in a restaurant down on Main Street. A lot of fresh monkeys make passes at me, but I wouldn't go out with any of them. Not even if they sailed up to the counter in their own private yacht. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Well, uh, what made you think I wouldn't turn out to be a fresh monkey, too? Uh, I don't know. Woman's intuition, maybe. <laughs> I see. You say uh, you work in a restaurant down on Main Street, huh? Mm-hmm. The Denver Cafe. You know it? No, I know where it is, Yeah. I hardly ever eat there, though. No? Well, um, 
Do you suppose you could get into the habit? Of eating at the Denver? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Sure, now that I know that you're working there. But uh, as the place is so good, what are you doing in this cafe? Isn't that a form of treason or something? (laughs) (laughs) No, not exactly. You see, my sister works here. I'm just waiting for her to get off duty. Oh, I see. Uh, In case you might be interested, my name's Emily. Emily? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that's a pretty name. But uh, isn't there any more to it? Uh Uh-huh. Swanson. Emily Swanson. Oh, it's nice knowing you, Emily. Well, um, you have a name, too, haven't you? (laughs) Seems to me I have. Uh, How would Claude David do? Well, that's as good as any. Better than most, maybe. Thanks. Not at all. And, uh... It's nice knowing you, too, Claude. You know, you're a swell kid, Emily. I'd like to see a lot of you. Frankly, I was rather hoping you'd say that. Well, there's one hitch. Uh, See, I work for a sheep rancher down near Corning. Uh, The place is close to 20 miles south of here, and, well, I haven't got a car. That's going to make things a little tough. Oh, not necessarily. What do you mean? Well, if you really want to see me once in a while, Claude, you don't have to worry about not having a car. You see, I have one. You have? Uh Oh, swell. Hey, look, Emily, you and I are going to go places and do things. You furnish the car, I'll furnish the money. We'll have some really grand times together, won't we? Uh, You bet we will, honey. It's been mighty lonesome living in that little trailer house down there all by myself, never going anywhere or seeing anybody. It's been lonesome for me, too. After I help out at home, it's all I can do to make the car payments. There's never anything left for a good time. Well, that's all over for both of us, Emily. Oh, really? You don't have to worry about money. I'll give you $5 a week towards wear and tear on the car and, well, maybe help with the payments besides. But Claude, you don't have to. That's the bargain, Emily. Take it or leave it. Oh, I knew you were a right guy, Claude. <laughs> <laughs> Woman's intuition, you know. Oh, but here comes my sister. I've got to go now. When will I see you? Uh, tomorrow night, 8 o'clock at the Denver Cafe. Is that all right? I'll see you. It's all right. Good night, Claude. Good night, Emily. And thus began a friendship which ran smoothly enough for the first few weeks. But on the evening of March 8th began a series of events that were to change the picture completely. Pedro Martinez, a sheep rancher who owned the property adjoining that of the rancher for whom Claude David worked, had gone early to bed after a hard day's work. Suddenly, the savage barking of his dogs outside the little trailer house awakened him in his slumber. for nothing. If you're Joe's friend, you're a friend of mine. Wait a minute, they're going to open the door for you. Hey, Carlos Bruno. Sierra to walk Come inside while I put on some of clothes. Uh, oh. oh, what's the matter? You got a gun. You bet I got a gun. Now stick up your hands and come outside here. Oh, oh. What are you going to do? I want your money. Hand it over quick and don't hold nothing out on me. I got only a nickel, not so. Oh, yeah. We'll find out about that. Turn around. Now, put your hands behind your back. <laughs> like, like this? Yeah, like that. When I get done wiring your wrists together, you won't be able to get into some mischief. You, you, you're not going to kill me? Uh, that depends on you now. Get back inside there. Hurry it up. Stand still while I go through your pockets. And have a look around. Honest, mister, I got only a nickel. It's in the pocket of my pants. Oh, these pants here? The ones thrown across this chair? Yes. That's all the... Oh, now I see you in the light. I know who you are. You do, huh? Well, if you're smart, you'll forget who I am. Pronto. You take care of the sheep in the next pasture. You hear what I said? Shut up, unless you want me to use the shotgun. All right, eh? I'll shut up. I don't seem to find nothing but that blame nickel you told me about. Ah, here. I'll take off that wire. Gracias. It was... Now, get into your clothes, get your checkbook and a pencil. Remember, any funny business and I'll blow your head off. My pencil, I I, I don't remember where I put it. I, I now, never think... mind the pencil, then. Here's a pen and ink on the table. Put them in your pocket as soon as you finish dressing. Si, senor. Uh, hey, can you uh, get a check cashed any place in Corning? Oh, I think so. My alarm clock says it's only half past nine. I think maybe they would cash one in the pool hall. Good. You ready to go now? Uh, I guess so. All right. Put your hands behind you again. 
I'll wire those wrists of yours good and snug so you won't start getting no, ideas. No. Please, senor, don't use the wire again. It hurts bad. That's your tough luck. Get your hands behind you. Please, si, senor. Uh, that's your car I saw parked just outside, isn't it? Yeah. Go on out there. Get in it. I'll do the driving. <laughs> Plain enough what you're doing from the headlights. Oh, I don't know, senor. My hands are so swelled up, maybe I can't write. Uh, you'll write that check and like it. Make it out to yourself for 15 bucks and then endorse it. Now get going. Hurry it up. That pool hall will be closing before long. All right, here's the pool hall. I'm leaving the shotgun in the car, but I got a revolver in my pocket, so don't try anything. No, senor. Go right up to the cigar counter and hand the guy your check. Remember, keep your coat sleeves pulled down so he won't be asking no questions about them sore wrists. See. Si. I'll be right alongside of you, so no monkey business, eh? And don't give me the money till we get back out to the car. No. Good evening, boys. Gonna have a little game? No, uh, I just wondered if... You would be good enough to cash for me a check. Why, of course, Pedro. Be glad to. Gracias, sir. Oh, fifteen dollars, eh? I think I could dig up that much for you, all right. You fellas coming town to see a show? Yeah, yeah. We saw a pretty good one too. <laughs> Full of wise cracks and good-looking bass. <laughs> <laughs> well, here you are, Pedro. A five and a ten. Is that all right? Si, senor. One is not so. Good night, boys. Come in again. Okay, now get into the car. No, not there. Move over into the driver's seat. You want me to drive? Of course. You're taking me back to my camp. Now turn over the dough. Oh. Here it is, senor. Thanks. Get out of here. If you should pull such a fool stunt as tell the sheriff about this, you'll be a dead man inside of 24 hours. Oh. Don't forget that. On March 18th, Ten days after the robbery of Pedro, Sheriff Jim Broom of Tahoma County received a telephone message at his office in Red Bluff. Yes? Yes? This is Uncle Sheriff Bailey, Glen County. I'm down here at a ranch about eight miles south of Clark. People who live here found the body of a young man in one of the green fields this morning. Accident of some kind? No. A plain case of murder. When I got here, I found the case was out of my jurisdiction. The body was found just over the county line in your territory. I'll stick around as you get here. Okay, and thanks, Bailey. I'll be down as soon as I can make it. Forty-five minutes later, Sheriff Broom, accompanied by District Attorney Claire Engel, Coroner Arthur Frickett, and Deputy Klein, reached the scene of the crime, a distance of 30 miles from Red Bluff. It had been raining heavily for several days, and the ground was still drenched when the officers stepped from their car. Whoever killed this poor chap certainly didn't bother to move the body very far away from the edge of the road, Sheriff. No, it looks to me as if it had been taken for a ride and then robbed. Yeah. Look at those deep ruts over there at the edge of the field, Mr. Engel. The fellow who killed this man and left his body here sure had a tough time getting his car out of the mud. Say, the coroner's trying to catch your eye, Sheriff. Maybe he wants you to look at something. Oh, uh, find anything of interest, Doc? Well, I wish you'd look at this body closely, Sheriff. It doesn't appear to me that only robbery was the motive here. All right, George, Doc, you're right. There's hatred and revenge back of this. No one would club a man to death with such savagery for any other reason. Uh, any idea who the man is? Well, I don't think it's anyone I know. Maybe if we turn the body on its back. Yeah. Good Lord. It's Carl Hardy. He's that young fellow that goes around the county selling drugs and small kitchen groceries. Yes, I know him, Sheriff. Now I'm beginning to see the light. You mean that uh, trouble over the girl? Of course. You remember when her mother had him arrested, don't you? Certainly, but no one in her family could be capable of a crime like this, Mr. Engel. Besides, he never really had it coming. He truly loved that girl. Yes, I know. As I remember it, the chief objection the girl's parents had to Carl was the difference in their ages. 
Carl's in his 30s somewhere, and I think the girl was 17. They built a lot of mountains out of that mole hill, too. Well, that's a possible motive, of course, but I sincerely hope it's on you. Yeah, so do I. This is going to be a terrible blow to the girl, Sheriff. You see, I happen to know that she and Carl were secretly married in Yuma, Arizona, some little time ago. Is that right? Yeah. Well, no matter who's responsible for this young man's murder, they'll not get away with it, so help me. Now, Sheriff, see these badly swollen hands and the deep marks on the wrists? It looks to me as if they'd been wired together. Uh-huh. And that can be mighty painful to the victim, too, Doc. I should say it can. Well, I can't find anything in the man's pocket, Sheriff. It looks like it might have been robbery after all. That battered head doesn't. Robbing the man could have been done for a blind. Now, if there had been a... Uh... Huh. Well, now, what's this? What? Find something, Sheriff? Well, I sure did. Part of the murder weapon. What is it? Well, it looks to me like the stock of a crag rifle. I just scuffed it out of the mud with the toe of my shoe. Seems to be pretty heavy, doesn't it? Mm, you better say it. Crag's a bold action gun, and the stock was broken off just back of the loading mechanism. Well, it was heavy enough to do plenty of damage here. He's got a number of wounds, any one of which could have caused death. I don't see a sign of a bullet hole anywhere on his body. Well, let's finish up here just as quickly as we can, boys. I want to get back to Red Bluff and start the wheels of this case moving. I'm going to find Carl Harder's murder or murderers if it's the last thing I do on Earth. Oh, hello, Mr. Engel. How are you, Sheriff? I just dropped in to see if there's anything new on the Hardy case. Well, here's something that may interest you. An item in a little day book that Hardy carried with him. It has no direct bearing on the murder, of course, but it, it'll stand investigation. This item right here, Sheriff? Yes. March 14th, 1938. Sold Claude David, 45 automatic Colt, $20. What's that all about? Well, naturally, I don't know what David wanted the gun for, but I do know that he's an ex-convict under parole to me. Parolees are not permitted to have guns in their possession. Who is this fellow David? Where does he come from? Well, from somewhere in the South originally, I think. He was sentenced to San Quentin in 1933 for sticking up a storekeeper with a gun in Modoc County. He was paroled in 37 and came to this county to work. I suppose he'd have any line on who might have killed Hardy? Well, I don't know, Mr. Engel, but I'm going to find out. As soon as Under Sheriff Moyer gets back to the office, we're going to take a little ride and pay Claude David a visit. Isn't that the little trailer house where David lives, Sheriff? Yeah, that's right, Ed. That's David standing in the doorway. Pull up right in front there. Hello, Claude. Oh, good afternoon, Sheriff. I had to come out this way on some work connected with Carl Hardy's murder. I just thought I'd drop by. Oh, I'm glad you did, Sheriff. Uh, that murder was a pretty terrible thing, wasn't it? Yes, pretty bad, Claude. Shame it had to happen. Yeah. I can't understand who'd want to do a thing like that to a nice fellow like Carl. Well, most of us can't. You knew Carl pretty well, didn't you? Well, I suppose so, in a way. Had he been out here lately? Why, yes, yes. He was out here the same evening he was killed. Is that so? Anything in particular he came to see you about? Well, yes. As I gave him a pup, and he came out to get it. Is that all he came out for? Yes, sir. He didn't come to collect for a gun he sold you? Oh, no, sir. You're sure of that, Claude? Of course, Sheriff, because Carl never sold me a gun. Well, I hope you're telling me the truth. You know, it's back to San Quentin for you if you're caught with a gun. I know that, Sheriff. Honest, I'd rather die than go back to that place. Oh, I didn't buy a gun from Carl. or from nobody else, either. All right, Claude. I just thought I'd ask is all. Well, we'd better get going, Ed. See you later, Claude. I'm glad to stop by, Sheriff. Go on. Well, the boy denied buying that gun gladly enough. What do you think, Sheriff? I think he's a cockeyed liar. <laughs> On the evening of the same day, Jim Froome had questioned him about the gun. Claude David came to the sheriff's home with a request to change his place of employment. David's manner was nervous and shifted, and Sheriff Froome became half convinced that the youth might actually be Hardy's murderer. The following morning, Froome called the parole board and received instructions to hold David in connection with the gun episode. You've had a few days to think it over now, Claude. Have you got anything to say? Yes, I... I do want to tell you something, sir. Well, good. Let's have it. Well, when Hardy came out to my place that evening, a 1936 Buick sedan followed him. And when he drove off the road to park in front of my trailer house, the Buick stopped and waited for them. Then a man got out, and when Hardy left my place, this fellow made him stop his car. Oh, yes? And what happened after that? Well, then another man got out of the Buick and walked over to Hardy's car. 
He got in the driver's seat, and the two men made Hardy get in between them. Hardy's car went west toward the old Corning Road, and the Buick went east toward Highway 99. What did these men look like? Well, one of them was blonde, about 19, and the other was dark, about 23. What time does this happen, Claude? Between 6.30 and 7 o'clock. You know who these men were? No, but uh, another car went by them, and I think the man driving it did. And do you know who was in that car? Uh, yes, Joe Mendes, a sheepman out there. Well, thanks for the information, Claude, but... Uh... Don't you think you'd better tell me about that gun now? Oh, I don't know nothing about any gun, Sheriff. All right. You can go back to your cell now. We'll check this other story. Turning out just like I thought, Ed. David's story of these men is just a pack of lies. Sure beginning to look that way. The distance from David's cabin to where he claims Hardy's car was stopped is too far for a person to be able to judge the age and complexion of anyone on the clearest of days. Yes, and David wants us to believe he could do it at 6.30 in the evening. On a cloudy evening at that. Oh, that must be Joe Mendes' place over there. Yeah. Uh-huh. We'll know more about this cock and bull story in a few minutes, I guess. Uh, wait, slow down, Ed. The fellow tending some sheep. Maybe that's Mendes. Okay, sure. You, Mendes? I see it. What is it you want? Well, uh, come over here a minute. We're from the sheriff's office. Sheriff's office? Yes, we'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, whatever you want to know. Can you tell me where your car was during the early evening of last March 17th, Mr. Mendes? March 17th, let's see. Oh, see, uh, my daughter, she drove to our home in Richfield that morning. And it wasn't out here again all day. I see. Do you know a sheep herder by the name of uh, Claude David? No, no, I don't. But there is something I think I'll tell you about you. Well, then don't hesitate to do it, Mr. Mendes. A couple of days ago, Pedro Martinez, who owns a sheep ranch near here, he came to my wife and told her a very strange story. We are close friends of Pedro's, and so I knew he would not lie. Besides, there were the marks on his wrist. Well, suppose you start at the beginning and tell the whole story in the proper order. You see, you see, of course. Well, Pedro first made my wife to swear that she would never repeat what he was about to tell her before he would say a word. He was very frightened. Frightened? At what? He was afraid Claude David was going to kill him. Claude David, huh? You see, one night after Pedro, he had gone to bed. His dogs woke him up with their barking. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Engel, there's no longer any question in my mind as to David's guilt in the Hardy case. The wrists of Pedro Martinez have been bound with wire. So are those of Carl Hardy. Now, two pairs of wired wrists in a single month doesn't leave any room for coincidence. I agree with you perfectly, Sheriff, but will a jury? Well, I'm not going to leave that to chance. I want an ironclad case against this murderer when he goes into court just as much as you do. Now, Pedro Martinez and other witnesses are waiting outside. I'm going to confront them with a the prisoner. You mind if I sit in? Of course not. Oh, uh, Mr. Martinez, Mr. Phelps, will you uh, come in, please? I wish you would let me go home, senor. Oh, you have nothing to be afraid of, Martinez. If Claude David, he found out I've been here, he will kill me for sure. Well, Claude David is not in the position where he can kill anyone right now. Mr. Ringo, this is the man whom the prisoner tied up with a wire and then robbed. Oh, yes. He made you write out a check, didn't he? Si, senor. And I'm the man who cashed it for Pedro at my pool hall down Corning. Gentlemen, I'm going to have David brought in here so that you may identify him. No, 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 no. Please, senor. Well, there's no way that he can hurt you, Martinez. I give you my word. Now, what can he do to you, Pedro, with a bunch of cops all around him? I'll call David in. All right, boys. Bring him in. Claude... I want you to stand just inside the door here and let these men have a good look at you. Okay, sir. Is this the man who held you up, Mr. Martinez? Uh, I will... Oh, sure, that's the guy. He was in my pool hall with Pedro that night. Now, if you recognize him, don't be afraid to say so, Mr. Martinez. Si, senor. It is the man. Thank you, gentlemen. I won't detain you any longer. You don't... Think he'll come after me now, senor? I not only don't think so, I know he won't. Goodbye, gentlemen. Oh. Thank you again. Goodbye, Sheriff. Well, Claude, 
What have you got to say? I never saw those men before in my life. What? You mean to say they were lying? No, they're just mistaken. I wonder if you realize just what your position is, David. Every scrap of evidence is against you. There's not a single clue, not a single statement of witnesses that's been in your favor. Oh, why don't you confess? Well, why should I confess? Because there's nothing else left for you to do. Uh, well, all right. I killed Carl Hardy. And robbed Pedro Martinez after threatening to kill him? Uh, yes. Well, what did you do with the money and the watch you took from Hardy's pocket? I didn't take anything from Carl's pocket. That's a lie, and you know it. Well, well, there was a waitress I was going around with. I gave her money to help keep up her car. Helped with some of the payments, too, now and then. We went out together two or three times a week and had fun. And so you killed one man and robbed another just so you could take your girlfriend out. Did the girl know about this? No. No, she just thought I had more money than I did. She didn't know anything about it. What do you suppose she'll think when she finds out? Well, I guess she'll be sorry the good times are over. Well, haven't you any remorse for what you've done, Claude? Oh, sure. It does seem a shame to kill a man and then get so little out of it. On the witness stand, however, David's detailed confession became a repudiated nightmare. He pleaded... Not guilty, Your Honor, by reason of insanity. But District Attorney Engel had other ideas. Now, you claim, David, that you don't remember anything from the time you stopped the car until you found yourself standing by the prone body of Carl Hardy. That's right. If you couldn't remember, why did you think you had killed him? Well, because I had a gun in my hands and there wasn't anybody else there. And you claim you're too insane to know right from wrong. Hmm? Yes, sir. Why did you throw your gun away and burn your gloves? So they, so they couldn't get me into trouble. Was that the reason you tried to get the blood off your shoes and clothing? Yes. And that was the reason you threatened to kill Martinez to keep him from telling on you? Yes. Then you knew you'd done wrong? Yes. Then you do know the difference between right and wrong? Yes. That's all. The state rests. <laughs> In just a moment, we shall present concluding facts regarding tonight's story. It's human nature when you find an exceptional value to tell your friends about it, whether it be a cafe that serves par excellence food or a store where quality is high and prices are low. And so you folks who have discovered the superiority of all-purpose Rio Grande Cracked obey that impulse to tell your friends about this great new motor fuel, the gasoline that is first in public service and should be first in yours. David was found guilty of Judge Sane and sentenced to die in the gas chamber of San Quentin. His is another story of the losing nature of crime. Broadcast 292 regarding a missing person. Suspect in this case is awaiting execution. That's all. Rose and Quinn.
Next week at this time, Rio Grande will present the Bellingham, Washington case of the Wicked Flea.